This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And today it's a lot of bad news, but you have, you have to figure out how to find the silver lining or the gold lining in this whole thing. And our guest is a longtime friend. And uh, I would say in today's world with social media and the iPhone and all this other stuff going on, one of the most important assets you can have is credible sources. And so today we have a person I look up to. I consider him my credible resource. Whenever I need to find out something, I go to this man. His name is Jim Records. I've been following him for years with his books, Currency Wars, and all this other stuff he's been writing, the new gold standards. And <clears throat> anyway, we need credible sources. And I'm so glad to have him on because I have so many questions, but we only have half an hour. Any comments, Kim? Well, it doesn't get more credible than advising the Pentagon, the White House, Congress, the CIA, CIA and the Defense Department. It doesn't get much more credible than that. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm thrilled to have Jim on the show. And I just want to say congratulations on your new book called Sold Out. Sold Out, How Broken Supply Chain, Surging Inflation, and Political Instability Will Sink the Global Economy. Congratulations on releasing that timing is crucial. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Robert. It's great to be with you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I always enjoy the interviews, but particularly in the run up to a, my, a new book. The, the book uh, comes out December 6th. It's called okay. Sold Out, but um, it's available for pre order on Amazon now, or you know, if you like, you know, Barnes and Noble or Powell's, a lot of other uh, booksellers out there. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a. It's fun, you know. Launching a book is like it's like a Broadway show or a movie. You you do your best. You work as hard as you can, but right. you don't. Sometimes it's a hit, sometimes not. You don't find out till the the day comes. It's very hard to predict, but uh, we're putting everything we can into it. So okay, and I was I was talking to Jim before we get on. Is that uh, the school I went to was U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York, one of the five federal schools, and I came under the, the Department of Commerce. Coast Guard Academy came under the Department of Treasury. Air Force, um, Naval Academy, and West Point come under the Department of Defense. So my background is supply chain. And uh, I drove oil tankers with Standard Oil. So Jim, I mean, given my background is supply chain anyway, why do you think people should read your book, Sold Out? What's in it for them? Well, uh, a lot, Robert, and thank you. Uh, the, um, the the thing about the supply chain, you know, I did all the, the research for the book. You, you say, well, okay, I got a loaf of bread, you know, but there's no there's no bread on the shelf. You know, where's the, where's the bread? Well, all right, well, the, for the bread, you need a baker, right? Okay, so, and, but you also need a truck driver to take it from the bakery to the shelf. You also need a wrapper, you know, you got to put a, some plastic or paper around it or something. Uh, well, the baker, he needs an oven, right? Where's the oven coming from? What about the electricity to power the oven? You need some ingredients. Where's the wheat? Well, the wheat doesn't come from the wheat field. It goes to a mill first and gets ground up into flour and all that. Uh, but the the mill gets it from a farmer. Where's the farmer get it? Well, he needs nitrogen, you know, fertilizer to grow the field. He needs a tractor and diesel fuel to like plow the wheat, et cetera. So the point is, um, you can segment a supply chain and say, well, you got to get from the bakery to the store. Yeah, that's valid. But every step along the way, first of all, the entire what's called the extended supply chain is much, much longer than people realize, number one. Correct. Number two, every spot on that supply chain <clears throat> has its own <clears throat> supply chain of inputs and outputs so that they can hold up their end. And that's just all for a loaf of bread. So the, the, the more you, you get into it, and again, you study this, Robert, so you're familiar with this. The, uh, the way I put it in the book, the supply chain is not part of the economy. The supply chain is the economy. They're so broad, so extensive, and so many moving parts that you can model it um, theoretically, and there's some math that you can apply, but nobody can comprehend it all. The, the idea that you can sit there and direct it, which they seem to be trying to do in uh, communist China, good luck with that. You can't actually do it. All you can do, you can facilitate it. You can get out of the way sometimes. Uh, you can stop doing stupid things, which the government is very good at, uh, but you can't actually direct it because it's far too complex, far too complex. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in terms of... Uh, you know, the impact on the economy, it's, it links very quickly to the monetary economy. We, we can, right. we can talk about that as well. 
Um, the, you know, we have inflation. Everyone sees it. You know, you got a Ford F one fifty pickup truck, uh, and you know, it used to be seventy five dollars for a tank of gas. Now it's one hundred and fifty dollars. Well, the demand for gasoline in that situation is what they call inelastic, which means you got to buy it no matter what, no matter what the price is. Uh, you don't like paying the higher price. You see it. You see inflation at the gas pump. You got to buy it because you got a business to run or errands to do or whatever the case may be. But what it means is that in that example, that extra 75 bucks to fill up your tank twice a week, let's say, so 150 bucks, that comes out of something else. You know, you're not going out for dinner. You're not buying a new dress or a new suit or a sporting event or a concert or whatever it may be. So there's demand destruction. It may not be at the gas pump, but it's in every, everywhere else in the economy. Correct. So you get into these ripple effects. So the, um, so the supply chain dysfunction, which in my example shows up in the form of higher gasoline prices, then ripples throughout the entire economy. Right. So the impact is enormous. So that's why when people are asking me, why, why should it be supply chain or sold out? <clears throat> I said, well, obviously you haven't been to a communist country because the right. shelves are bare. Right. They're bare. That's, that's one of the biggest things of all. And I went to the academy at King's Point where, where we're basically told, you know, that supply chain is macro, macro, macro. And if you don't oh. see the macro, you won't see the micro. Well, that's right. And I, I, I mentioned that in the book, you know, certainly, um, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, East Germany, right. parts of Central Europe during the Cold War, during the 1950s, so even the Soviet Union, the shelves were bare. You would, yes. if, you thought there, if you thought there was meat coming, you know, later in the day, you would queue up for hours just to get a, a cut of meat. Uh, third world countries, you know, I've been to many of them, traveled extensively throughout Africa, South Asia, India, elsewhere. And yeah, you see that all the time um, uh, where, where they just don't have things. We're not used to seeing that in the United no. States or in Western <clears throat> Europe or Germany, France, but we are now. And it's not that you go into a supermarket and every shelf is bare. That was the East German model. But you'll say, well, I'm, I'm here to get diapers or, you know, I like hot salsa or, you know, love it, whatever it may be. And then that thing, it, that section of the shelf is fair. It's like, oh, no hot sauce this week or no, uh, you know, uh, a certain kind of vegetable this week, et cetera. And then what happens is interesting because you go once, the shelf's empty. You go twice, the shelf's empty. You go the third time, and they just got a case, right? But if I normally buy two jars, I'll buy the whole shelf. I'm like, hey, I'm buying 10 because, uh, uh, you know, I don't know when it's coming in again. I want the Celeste. So that's hoarding. You can call it hoarding if you want to be a little pejorative <laughs> about it. But what I'm doing is I'm creating my own safety stock, my own inventory in my right. own kitchen because I can't count on the supermarket. Well, what does that do to the next person who's looking for the hot sauce? They don't find any. So it feeds on itself, and it just gets worse. Right. Uh, and it um, th and the point you make, Robert, is a really important one because I start the book in the introduction with a description of a Bronze Age shipwreck that was discovered in Ulubarun. Uh, hey, Jim, uh, Jim, that's one of my most favorite stories you ever told. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> I because I'm 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 a, I'm a merchant marine officer. Yeah. And what you were well, that, talking about the supply chain, I'm going, holy mackerel, because that's that, all we did. That one one last little, thing, one last yeah. thing, Jim. Yeah. Kim and I have friends that are Cubans. Uh huh. And when the first thing they come over here is they go to they go to Safeway or Walmart. Yep. They say it's a religious experience. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I remember my first my first visit to uh, Saudi Arabia was in the early 1980s or 80, 81, somewhere in there. So like, whatever, 40 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to see like some, you know, Bedouins or some, you know, uh, ancient cities or something like that. And my friends, my host, they took me to a supermarket and they took me up and down the aisles to show, <laughs> hey, we're just like you. We got, and it was, uh, I recall it was, it was in November. They took me to the turkey section. They had frozen turkeys. They were like, see what we got? We got, I was like, hey, where's the archaeology? They wanted to show me the frozen turkeys, but I can understand <laughs> yeah, why. Because we, had a, we had a friend that came, I forget where he was, but they, he came to the U.S. and they, his, his host wanted to take him to all the, you know, the, the, all the tourist spots and sure. all of the the most famous places. And he's like, I just want to go to the food store. I just want to yeah. see food on shelves. <laughs> yeah. That was the highlight of his whole trip. Well, well, that's exactly right. But that, but now we're, we're experiencing the opposite. Americans who are spoiled and used to it and take it for granted are finding that maybe sometimes the stuff is not there. But, but to your point, Robert, you, you, it's a very powerful point. I say, Supply chains are not new. Uh, this this Bronze Age shipwreck I was talking about, it did a, um, a <clears throat> coastwise trade in the Mediterranean counterclockwise because the the northern coast, the European coast, the winds blew, the recently winds, and the southern coast, the African coast, were westerly winds. So it would make a big circle. But when they explored the shipwreck, underwater archaeology, so they found amber, which comes from the Baltic Sea, 
They found gold, which comes from Sudan. They found swords, which had been made in present-day Syria, you know, Phoenicia at the time, but present-day Syria. Uh, they found olive oil, which, you know, comes from Italy. Uh, the uh, the boat itself is made of Lebanese cedar, which, of course, comes from Lebanon. And there was a carving of Queen Nefertiti of, of Egypt. She was one of the, uh, she was the queen at the time. And um, so what, so if you say, okay, well, let's just plot that out. Where Where is this stuff coming from? So you go from the Baltic, Baltic Sea or, you know, almost to, not quite to the Arctic Circle, down to southern Sudan, almost to the equator, uh, as far east as present day Iran, you know, Persia, and as far west as Spain, that's 5 million square miles. So, and that was all on one vessel because they were picking stuff up and dropping stuff off. Well, it was coastwise commerce. Um, well, so that's a huge supply chain, 5 million square miles in 20 different present day countries. So they had the supply chain then. So, so what's new about the supply chain? What's new, and this really started in 1989, is what I call supply chain science that it became an academic subject. There are a lot of colleges, you get a major in supply chain, you know, supply chain studies. Um, but it was a combination of increased computing power, new algorithms, artificial intelligence, uh, and then uh, you know, new technology. So we got extended supply chains. So it was really the, the scientific aspect of it, the academic aspect of it that transformed it. And uh, it developed into what I call supply chain 1.0 which is 1989 to, uh, sorry, yeah, 1989 to 2019. So that was a 30 year stretch that has now collapsed. Uh, we still have stuff, but it's very, we're in a very middling muddling phase. We're going to have supply chain 2.0, the new supply chain. I talk about that in the book and what that's going to look like. That's going to take five or 10 years to put together. I talked to an individual, you know, of supply chain, you know, you got millions of people involved, but this was the guy um, who was prob probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took three years to blow it up, break it down. It's going to take 10 or 15 years to rebuild. This is not going to happen overnight. So we're, we're in this in-between stage. But the thing that, that caused it to collapse, there were a number of things. Everyone looks at um, uh, the, the war in Ukraine and Russian sanctions, and that made it worse. And then they look at the pandemic and the, the pandemic panic and the fascist public policy that came out of it. Well, that made it worse. But it really started, you can trace it back to the Trump tariffs in 2018, because I found some um, research on cargo shipments, because uh, there are all these vessels, you know, again, you know this from your experience, Robert, uh, oil tankers, uh, dry bulk carriers, uh, other kinds of, you know, container cargo ships, et cetera. We know where they all are, where they all have GPS, with, unless you're a couple of pirates here and there, but basically we know where they're leaving, where they're going, what they have, it's all, it's all publicly available. Uh, and this one um, researcher tracked it, and she could show the breakdown beginning in 2018 with the Trump tariffs. So let me just give you a really concrete example. So 2000, 2018, Trump puts tariffs on China on uh, you know appliances and solar panels. So, yeah, Korea makes some, but it was mostly coming from China. It was really targeted at China. Um, and I, I don't want to debate the tariffs. I actually think it was a good idea by Trump, but but I'm not here to debate that public policy. I'm trying to explain how this thing broke down. Um, so what did China do? Well, China, U.S. and Brazil are the two biggest uh, producers of soybeans. China is the biggest importer of soybeans because they need the protein and they don't have that much. Um, and so they were China was buying their soybeans from the U.S. because they're like, hey, this is one way to kind of balance trade with the U.S. The deficit won't be quite so big because we'll buy their soybeans. Well, when Trump throws the tariffs on China, China says, we're buying our soybeans from Brazil. And they shifted all those purchase orders to Brazil. Well, that's not a phone call. I mean, you got to reroute vessels, you got to expand right. port capacity, right. you got to get transportation lanes from the farmers to the ports, et cetera. And the people who do that, the real people, real companies, they don't want a six month deal, they want a five year deal. So that was all done, but you've now scrambled vessels all over the world, changed, you know, port uh, uh, entry and uh, embarkation, et cetera, on like a five year basis. And so then, so they're now, China's getting the soybeans from Brazil. What's the U.S. doing with all the soybeans? Well, we looked around and said, well, the Netherlands needs them. So we're sending them to the Netherlands. Well, again, you got to scramble vessels. You're not going through the Panama Canal anymore. You're coming out of the port of Houston, et cetera. So it's a concrete example of how 
you know, the, the I can't sit in Washington and say, throw tariffs on the Chinese. But now you're, you're scrambling global trade. That has, again, as I mentioned, taken 30 years to build. And the same thing's going on with semiconductors, semiconductor sanctions. And again, COVID made it worse, pandemic made it worse, and, and Ukraine made it worse. So we, we are where we are. But, but that's really the point. It's a complex dynamic system. You tweak one little bit, and then it collapses over there. And everyone said, how did that happen? Well, the answer is that's how, that's how it happens. Yeah, so anyway, um, go, ahead, go ahead, Kim. Um, you, you said supply chain 2.0. Is that to come? It's to come, but what it's it's evolving. Well, it, I talk about this in the conclusion of the book, and in, and uh, uh, at the end, um, it wait, wait. The it, book is sold out, and this is macro, macro. I mean, you want a religious experience? Go to a <laughs> store in a communist country, and it's empty. He went to the cupboard, and the cupboard was bare, and that's what Jim is warning us of. Yeah, you, got, it you, might get bare. If you want to take a big picture perspective, it's hard to get bigger than the supply chain because it's kind of everything. Yeah. Uh, but but to Kim's point, you know, as I said, there there have always been supply chains. There will always be supply chains, but they have certain members, partners, transportation lanes, or certain kind of rules of the road for uh, no pun intended. Um, so what we're going to have, I call it a, a college of nations. Um, Janet Yellen has called it friendshoring. Uh, Emmanuel Macron has called it a constellation of nations, different names. But what it means is that we'll trade and we'll have supply chains, but it will just be our friends. In other words, um, democratic, uh, you know, liberal societies, I don't want to get into politics, but broadly speaking, U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Western Europe, uh, probably India, a few other countries, we'll trade with each other. Uh, because we're not enemies, but China is going to be on their own. China, and by the way, they, people say U.S. is decoupling from China. That's true, but China is decoupling from the U.S. This is mutual. This is like a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, you know, bad breakup, and that, and China wants out as much as we do. So, but China is going to have to figure out its own supply chain. Who are its partners going to be? Well, they'll get natural resources from Africa and outsource their manufacturing to South Asia. So life will go on. But it will be much less efficient, but more resilient. And that's the trade off. The, the reason things are breaking down is that once the science kicked in, you know, the math and the AI and the computing power and all the things I mentioned, um, what was the goal? What were they trying to do? Well, they were trying to lower costs. So we'll, we'll outsource to China because labor costs are lower. Uh, we'll, um, you know, basically get our natural resources from some other place. There's something called cross docking. What's cross docking? Well, it's when like a truck shows up at a warehouse. They used to unload it, put it in the warehouse, and put it on another truck. Well, Walmart figured, well, why don't we just take it from truck A to truck B and skip the warehouse? Well, okay, that's more efficient. Uh, in fact, what what what's the meaning of a big box store? A big box store, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. It is a warehouse. I mean, that's why it's so big because it is a warehouse. You're cutting out the warehouse, you know, et cetera. So the, you know, the, but the point being, everything was to get get the cost lower, lower, lower. But there was a hidden cost that no one took into account, which is when you do that, yeah, you get a lower cost at retail, but you've made the whole thing more more uh, fragile, really frail, really subject to breakdown. When you when your supply chain is nine thousand miles long, and you've got ten shippers and distributors and warehouses uh, in between, and one part of it breaks down, the whole thing falls down. Uh, or So we're seeing this in Europe right now. For example, um, uh, you know, so Germany makes great cars, you know, BMWs and Audis and Volkswagens and all that. Well, it turns out that they've got about like 25 miles of wiring in the cars. And um, how do you keep, you can't like run it on the floor, right? So there are these plastic conduits and they put all the wires in the conduit and they run it from you know, where they want. Well, those conduits are made in Ukraine uh, and they ship them to Germany and they put them in the cars. Well, Ukraine's got a little problem, a few <laughs> problems right now. They're not making conduits. Well, guess what? They've had to shut down the Volkswagen assembly lines because they couldn't get a plastic part from the Ukraine. How many jobs is that in Germany? I said, what does that do to the price of cars? You know, try buying a new car these days, by the way. The salesman say, yeah, I'll take the order. See you in a year. When the car comes in, so um, so that's an example. How like, you know one plastic part from Ukraine, Ukraine breaks down because of war. You got to shut down an assembly line in, in Germany. So we're in that phase right now. It will. They'll say, okay, no more con plastic conduits from Ukraine. We're going to build those in I don't know maybe the Czech Republic. But the point is, is it's going to be more expensive. 
But the, the extra cost that you pay, it's like buying insurance for your house. You know, you, uh, you, you nobody wants their house to burn down, but if anything happens, you're glad you have the insurance. Correct. When you, when you write that check to the insurance company, you don't think you're wasting your money. You think you're buying some good protection. Same thing when the when the new supply chains emerge, it'll be a little more expensive, but it's not wasted money because you'll you'll have something that can stand up to shocks, and we've seen quite a few lately. So let me so let me, let me give this. Um, the book is called Sold Out, and the question is that you know that old FM station W I I F M. What's in it for me? I'm going to tell you how it makes sense. Is because Kim and I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, because we're real estate people. And one of the reasons we moved to Phoenix, Arizona, this is 25 years ago, was a little company called Taiwan Semiconductors moved here. And with China threatens to pound Taiwan, Arizona is today called Silicon Desert. Right. And it's boosting our, you know, and real estate dependent upon jobs. So when Taiwan Semiconductors moved to for Phoenix, Arizona, Kim and I moved here too. So if you understand that's what, what Jim's book sold out is to you, it's once you can see what's going on, he's in, in, as an old song by Buffalo Springfield, you know, battle lines are being drawn. You're either on China's side or you're on our side. And that's going to be the world economy. Right. And the, the Taiwan Semiconductor move, they may have put roots down a long time ago, but they're moving in big time. They just yep. announced uh, two $10 billion plus uh, fabrication plants they're building. They're still called fabs. They, it's where they yep. make semiconductors. Yep. So yep. like, wait a second. Okay, you're the biggest, most advanced semiconductor company in the world. You're based in Taiwan. Why are you putting $20 billion into Arizona? And by the way, Intel is doing the same thing, I believe, in yep. Oregon, 10, yep. uh, Washington, maybe a $10, $10 billion plant. Well, this is what I talked about earlier with the College of Nations or onshoring or friendshoring, whatever you want to call it. We still need semiconductors, but we're not going to build them in Taiwan. We're Correct. certainly not going to build them in China. Let's build Correct. them in Arizona and Oregon. More expensive, maybe. Even, but, even but Ohio, even, they're building stuff now. Correct. But, Replacing but again, auto. You, know. you can, it may be more expensive, but you can count on it. Right. You're in the same country, good rule right. of law, you know, and obviously good jobs for Americans. So that's uh, that's great. But okay. it's okay. An example. Yeah, we, we, need, we need to go to a break, but I, I would really encourage everybody to read Jim's new book, Sold Out, because it's going to affect everybody. And those who pay attention will get richer, and those who uh, don't will go to shelves that are empty. We'll be right back with Jim Ricketts. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth-building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait. Access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Day Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Our special guest today is, like I said, in today's over-communicated to the world with YouTube and Twitter and all the other stuff, what you're looking for are credible sources of information. And our great, great friend, longtime friend of ours, Jim Rickards, he is as credible as he come. I remember his first book, Currency Wars. I went, oh, this guy gets it. He gets it. And so we're very happy to have him. His latest book is called Sold Out. I think everybody should read it because it's macro, macro, macro. You'll see where the world economy is shifting to, from who to where and why. Any comments there, Kim? Well, I, I'm just always, I'm always, I just want to sit and listen to you, Jim, because you have such an in-depth in uh, degree of knowledge and it's, it's, you just make my head spin. Um, but you also have a great newsletter called Strategic Investment. Um, or strategic intelligence, right. strategic intelligence, great newsletter as well. I just want to put that out to the people. Um, so we were talking just at the break, um, Robert, you're talking about liquidity crisis and, and Jim dollar shortages. What, what is happening in that world? Because well, uh, a lot so much money, everybody thinks there's a ton of money out there. Sure. Um, people say, well, do the fed, you know, is pr you know, at the height of the pandemic panic, going back to 2020, the feds balance sheet was up to about nine, 
trillion dollars. I had to get used to saying trillion instead of billion, but about $9 trillion. And it's come down a little bit uh, since then, but uh, people say, well, wait a second, how can there be a dollar shortage or a liquidity crisis when the Fed printed $9 trillion? Well, the answer is you have to understand how the money system works and where real money creation comes from, and it does not come from the Fed, and here's why. The Fed did print the money. That's that's real. But the way they do it, they the Fed buys bonds and treasury notes from the primary dealers, from the big banks. And the, you know, they call up and offer me a 10-year note. Okay, here's the price done. The Goldman Sachs will send the 10-year note to the Fed, and the Fed pays for it with money that comes out of thin air. So that is money printing. It's as simple as that. But then Goldman Sachs, in my example, takes the money and gives it back to the Fed, because the Fed's a bank, they deposit it at the Fed in the form of what they call excess reserves, and the Fed pays interest on excess reserves, so the Goldman's actually making money off it. The point is the money didn't go anywhere. The Fed did create it out of thin air, that much is true, but the recipient who sold the bonds gives it back to the Fed. It sits on the Fed's balance sheet, so the asset side, you've got all these treasury notes, but the liability side, you've got all these deposits, and it just sits there, and it doesn't do anything. So where is the real money that powers the economy? If there is, you know, if, if it does at all, where does that come from? It comes from the banks because the banks can do the same thing. When the bank makes you a loan, what do they do? They, your business, you set up a checking account. They say, okay, here's a million dollar loan. They put the million dollars in in your checking account. Where did that money come from? They just they just said you got the money right, and so they have an asset which is a loan from you with note, and they got a liability which is your deposit. So banks create money kind of the same way the Fed does, except it's supposed to be in private commerce. And that money actually can go somewhere. If you're a business, you got a payroll, you got to buy stuff or invest stuff, et cetera. But that's, there's not much of that going on. Velocity is very low. The turnover of money is low. The M1, M2, those are different forms of money. I love the fact that the Fed has M0, M1, M2. It shows they don't even know what money is because they got three different flavors. But uh, the point is that doesn't, that hasn't really been going anywhere. Now, but here's the key. Nine trillion dollars on the balance sheet, maybe you know five, six trillion today. It's a lot of money, but the notional value of derivatives off balance sheet of the banks is one quadrillion dollars. And for listeners who might not have heard the word quadrillion before, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. That's so thirty-two you, zeros or something like that. I, I've lost count, but it's uh, but but trillion, uh, sorry, quadrillion is one thousand trillion so your nine trillion at the fed doesn't get you very far if you have to support one thousand trillion dollars worth of derivatives and how does that work well the answer is mostly the banks uh doing off balance sheet swaps and swaptions and uh other futures and forwards and you know we don't have to go down the whole litany of names with either each other because they're trading firms or with hedge funds who want them for speculation or hedging or sovereign wealth funds or other institutions. There's a whole network of, of participants. But these are the big boys. These are the the the, the trillion dollar institutions, the you know, BlackRock and uh the Temasek and the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway. The, 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 these are the 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 big players involved in this market. Okay. So you have a thousand trillion dollars of derivatives off balance sheet, by the way. You will not see this looking at a bank balance sheet. You got to read the footnotes, you got to know what you're looking at. How is that supported? Well it's supported with collateral. Not 100%, not even close, but maybe 1%, 2%. you got to put up some margin money to be in the game, but then you can have a lot more off-balance sheet. Okay, so what's the best form of collateral? Well, it depends. It, it, whether you're in a liquidity crisis or not, whether people are feeling confident or are worried, whether they think things are going to go great or start to collapse. So as things get more difficult, and that's the phase we're in right now, uh, the, um, the, the quality of the collateral has to go up. You know, So the banks are now saying to each other, I don't want your mortgages. I don't want your stupid corporate bonds. I don't even want 10 year treasury notes. Get me bills, treasury bills. These are short term, very liquid, one year maturity or less. A lot of them are four week bills, eight week bills, six month bills. These are very short term, very liquid. They are the best collateral there is. And the banks are saying to each other, that's what I want. Okay. So now you're. Barclays Bank or Deutsche Bank or Unicredit, Credit Suisse or bank, you know, uh, some major Japanese bank, et cetera, where are you going to get the bills? Well, you got to buy them from a dealer or you can buy them at auction. The Treasury has auctions or you can get them from the Fed. But to buy a dollar-denominated Treasury bill, you need dollars. So 
That's that's why the dollar is so strong. Everyone's like, hey, Jim, yeah, we got these huge budget deficits and trillion dollars of expenses and bailouts and handouts and, um, you know, 131 percent debt to GDP ratio, uh, 31 trillion dollars in debt, um, you know, et cetera. How can the dollar be so strong? Well, the answer is it has nothing to do with everything I just said. The dollar is strong because everybody in the world needs dollars to buy treasury bills to prop up the balance sheets of the one quadrillion of derivatives that nobody can see. And this is real. This is way behind the curtain. Ken. this is real inside baseball in terms of how the international monetary system actually works. So the, the strength of the dollar, which by the way, is a headwind for gold, you know, the euro's down, sterling's down, um, the Swiss francs are down. Gold hasn't actually gone down a lot. It hasn't gone up a lot, but it's kind of, it's holding its own, but a strong dollar means anything denominated in dollars is going to go down because if the dollar gets stronger, the dollar price of the commodity gets lower or at least doesn't go up a lot. Okay, so you got to, first of all, you got a mad scramble for dollars. Why? To buy treasury bills. Why? Because they're the only collateral to prop up everything I just described. Now, but there's evidence of this. And again, you have to know where to look. So right now, the Fed has what they call the reverse repo, repo program. What is that? Well, any bank, any major institution that wants treasury bills can call the Fed and say, Give me some treasury bills and you give the Fed cash. You know, it can be overnight or a couple of days, or whatever. The Fed pays you interest, so you're making a little money, but they send you the treasury bills. Well, why isn't that the solution? Why, why, why doesn't that work? Well, the answer is you can do that and you can get those treasury bills, but you cannot rehypothecate them. You cannot pledge them to anybody else. You have to keep them. And the Fed might want to unwind that at any time. Well, that's not good enough because if I'm supporting some other transaction with somebody else and they're supporting another transaction through a chain of could be 25 banks all in the same, you know, back to back, I want treasury bills that I can pledge to Credit Suisse so they can pledge to Barclays so they can pledge to JP Morgan, et cetera. So I got to get treasury bills either at auction from the treasury and they're not issuing that many because actually the, the you know, budget deficit is coming down a little bit uh, or buy them in the secondary market. So, so, but, so but here's, Jim, here's, Jim, yeah. Jim. Come back on. Let me let me let me test with you my idea of reapothecation. Okay. Sure. So in the silver market, you have SLV, which is the, the ETF, and right. GLD. Right. And this rehypothecation, this is what I've heard, was that for every ounce of silver, it's been sold two hundred and forty times. They've sold That's the same ounce of silver more than once. That sounds right. I haven't looked at that data, but that, that, that sounds right. That, I, my a conservative estimate would be 100 to 1, but if you told me 200 to 1, I would say, yeah, that's not surprising. That's, but that's rehypothecation. Well, it is. It's also leverage. <laughs> and yeah, that, I understand. But that's, but that's the but point. That's, the, nine, the $9 trillion of Fed money has been leveraged into a quadrillion of, of derivatives. That's correct. That, that, that'd be like pledging my Toyota to 50, 50 pawn shops. Or pledging it to one pawn shop who pledges it to a bank, who pledges it to another bank, who pledges it to another That's bank. That's rehypothecation. That's rehypothecation. Okay, so you, good. That's... You can pledge it once, but it'll get pledged 25, time, 25 more times. And that's what's and, happened and, and, in the derivatives and, and, market. They've, they've just sold it again and again and again and again. Correct. Uh, again, it's not one person selling the same collateral 25 times. It's 25 people selling it to each other. So it's and a so, chain. So, so when, but if it, you it, buy... it's the same thing, Kim. It's, it's, it's leverage. If you buy a treasury bill, you cannot rehypothecate it. If you buy it, you can. If you get it from the Fed, you cannot. And that's the key. So so just to, oh. kind of put, some, just to put some data behind this, Robert, just to show it's not a theory. So I can, if I'm a bank, I can call up the Fed and get treasury bills, you know, in 15 minutes. And there's a certain price. They're going to pay me interest. I'm going to get a discount and give it back. If I buy it in the treasury market, there's also a price. I got to, you know, they, they always trade, they, they mature at par. So you buy them at a discount. And the difference is how much interest you make. Okay. The interest, the yield to maturity on the treasury bill that you buy in the secondary market is lower than what the Fed will give you for free just by picking up the phone. So why would you ever buy a treasury bill in the secondary market with a lower yield than what the Fed will hand you? Well, the answer is because you can rehypothecate it. You're desperate. You need, you want that you're willing to take less yield to get the one that you can pledge instead of getting a higher yield for the one you can't pledge. And so it's all about the rehypothecation. It's all the about one, the, uh, the, one you can, the one you can pledge. You can pledge it how many times? 
Well, you you pledge it once, but the person you pledge it to can pledge it to somebody else. So the answer oh, is fifty. It can, it can 50 uh, like correct. A the answer, action. the answer is fifty times or hundred times. No one, no one knows because okay. it just gets it, it's just out there. Um, but but the point being, the fact that um, yields on secondary market purchases are lower than what the Fed will give you for free tells you how desperate people are to get those bills. So that's we, causing a liquidity crisis. That's the beginning of a liquidity crisis. And, 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 and that's you, what you're warning everybody about right now. Right. I mean, you, I, you want a lot of things. I spoke to someone recently. I said, well, Jim, I, I hear you. When's all this coming to a head? And I said, maybe yeah. this winter or this spring, sooner yeah. than you think. And, and I based that on the last two super liquidity crises when the world almost completely collapsed, or maybe it did, were 1998, that was long-term capital management in Russia, and 2008 during right. Lehman Brothers. But I remind people... Okay, to September 15th, Sunday, September 15th, 2008, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy on, electronically on a Sunday night. And that was like, we all know what happened next. But that crisis started in 2007. Remember August 9th, 2007, Jim Cramer and Aaron Burnett on oh, CNBC, right. and he's yelling, they know nothing. They know. No-. Well, he was right. They didn't know anything. They were idiots, I mean, they, meaning the Fed. Um, but and then, then you know, Hank Paulson and the Super Civ and the Sovereign Wealth Fund bailout and then Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And so there was a lot leading up to the Lehman Brothers, but it took a year. It took a year to go around. Uh, same thing with long-term capital. It, it came to a head in September 1998. We were hours away from shutting every financial market in the world. We got the $4 billion in, stabilized the balance sheet, and life went on. But it was a really close call. But that started in June 1997 when Thailand broke the peg to the dollar, started to right. run on the bank in Thailand. It right. spread to Malaysia. Indonesia, South Korea, you know, you always hear the expression, right. you, time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Well, sadly, there was blood in the streets, real blood in Korea because people got killed. And then it went to Russia, then long-term capital. But my point is, the everyone knows the, the acute stage, September 98 or September 2008, but it began a year earlier. So now everything we, we've just been talking about is already happening. It's been happening since last spring. So if you stick to this one year rule, and it's not a hard and fast scientific rule, but it, we've seen two cases where it took a year to come around. If that's your rule, and it started in March 2022, and there's good evidence for that, then kind of March 2023 is your D-Day. And what, what was March 2022? That's when these these signs we're talking about, Kim, where you know, the yield on, on the secondary market treasury bills was below what the Fed would give you, inverted yield curves, big deal. Uh, so right now, the, the Treasury, uh, U.S. Treasury yield curve, you can look this up, I mean, it's not, not secret data. The yield to maturity on a one-year bill is uh, lower than a 10-year Treasury note. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, high, it's higher than a 10-year Treasury note. That's called yield curve. But why should that be true? Like, if I'm going to lend you money for a year, okay, you might want a certain interest rate, but if I'm going to lend you money for 10 years, I want a higher interest rate because there's more risk, inflation, credit risk, et cetera. So why is the yield on the 10-year note lower than the one-year bill? It makes no sense, except unless you think something bad is going to happen. If you think we're going to go into a really bad recession in a couple of months, which is what I was just talking about, then that yield on the 10-year note is going to look really good. You're going to have huge capital gains when that when that actually collapses. The Fed can control the very short end of the yield curve. They cannot control five-year notes, 10-year notes, let alone 30-year bonds. So the the Treasury yield curve is telling you, it's like right there in your face, it's telling you that something bad is going to happen. Otherwise, those long, those long maturity yields would not be lower unless you think something bad is going to happen. So again, let's get back to this thing called liquidity crisis. You, you've been warning, Jim has been warning so many things that could go in all directions, like executive fourteen oh six seven and all that stuff, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Well, it's 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 uh, you may it's, not they're all related. Interested. Yeah, you may not be interested in fourteen oh uh, six seven, but it's interested in you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so why? What does a liquidity crisis look like to mom and pop? Uh, it looks like um, can't get a loan. Um, interest rates on credit cards go up. Interest rates on mortgages go up. Uh, at least initially. But where it really comes home is that, okay, that, that's the initial stage. A lot of people don't understand that interest rates peak 
after the recession begins. There, it's a lagging indicator because as you go into the recession, people are like, hey, my, I don't want to lay people off. My revenues are going down. I'll borrow the money. It's, it'll be fine. And then that causes interest rates to go up. And, but then when it's like, then when it really hits you, you know, just slams you, you're like, okay, I got to fire everybody. And you're, you're lucky you don't go out of business and, and you default on the loan. Uh, so interest rates are lagging indicator. Unemployment is a lagging indicator because people, they, they really don't want to lay people off. They will if they have to, but that's like the last thing you do after you've cut out a lot of other stuff. So you can't, so people look at uh, unemployment slow and interest rates are high, you know, everything's good. No, they, these are the things that have, these are the things that turn around after the recession. So uh, one, one, one last question. One last question. So, so many people have gotten used to not rehypothecation, but refinancing. Right. And so if they cannot refinance their way out, they default. That's, that's a crisis on the personal side. Sure. And you default or business defaults, business fail, unemployment goes up and prices right. come down. And that, that kind of gets to the second half of my book. So it's five chapters. You know, there's an introduction and a conclusion. The first three chapters are on the supply chain. Okay. A lot of anecdotal stuff. What's going on? Describe it in detail. Why is it breaking down uh, and what caused it? That's chapter two. And then where are we going from here? What, what's next? What should we expect? That's chapter three. But okay. there are two more. There are two more chapters, four and five. One on inflation. But here's the thing: nobody sees coming deflation, right? Because when Depression. all this stuff kicks in, the liquidity crisis you're talking about, Robert and um, yeah. Kim, everything we talked about with the off balance sheet and the rehypothecation, all that. When all that hits home, uh, you end up in deflation, and nobody's ready for that. Correct. And so this is this is my. I mean, I could go on forever. So the, one of the first things that Biden did was cut off the Keystone XL pipeline. Right. And again, I went to U.S. Merch Marine Academy. I'm an oil tanker driver. When I saw that, I said, he's going to sink the middle class. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really religious, but I remember from Sunday school, they said the poor will always be amongst us. Mm -hmm. But when I saw Biden cut, down, cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, he screwed the middle class. That's he right. just wiped them out. Right. And the middle class got wiped out. I got rich. Kim and I got richer because we were selling real oil at $30 a barrel and oil went to 130 the next day. But mom and pop, this is the microeconomics. My mom and pop are standing next to their Lincoln SUV, filling up the gas pump going, how come it was $50 last week is a hundred dollars this week. So in my opinion, when Biden cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, he basically took out the middle class. Would, how, do, how does that fit with your logic? Uh, it fits perfectly, and I agree with that. But then I always ask, well, okay, if the middle class lost, and they did, who's the big winner? The biggest winner of cutting off the Keystone pipeline was Warren Buffett. Because a couple of years earlier, he bought the Burlington Northern Railroad. That's correct. And what people oil don't shipment. understand, the, the oil from Alberta is still coming in. It's just instead of coming through a pipeline, which is kind of clean and inexpensive, which is supply coming, chain, which is you know pipelines supply, supply chain, chain. But, but it's coming in by by train, right. so oil, oil tanker cars. So you line up you line up a hundred oil tanker cars in one train. It's a pipeline on wheels. <laughs> that's why they did that. Well, that's why Warren Buffett did. It. He could see oh it coming. So Warren Buffett owns the railroad. They're bringing in the oil from Alberta. They always have. They're bringing it on Warren Buffett's railroad, not somebody else's Keystone pipeline. So. Around. So yeah, the middle class gets screwed. That was always part of the plan. And by the way, I mean, these greenies, you have to understand the, the green news scam people, they've won a $10 gasoline all along. It had nothing to do with, you know, oil supply and energy supply mm -hmm. and demand. They just want $10 gasoline because they don't want anybody to be able to afford to drive because they want you to buy an electric vehicle. Don't get me started on that. I, have, I, just, <laughs> I, mean, well, I just invested in a lithium mine in, in Central Asia because price of lithium is tripled. I mean, how are you going to make batteries? You need, how do you make a battery? You need lithium, nickel, uh, cobalt, uh, uh, you know, Silver. copper, et cetera. You need a lot of poisonous chemicals, basically, yeah. that do a lot more environmental damage digging them up. But, um, yeah, good good luck with that. It's not going to last, but it'll, it'll run. It'll last in the short run because you have idiots in charge. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they, they want a ten dollar gasoline all along, and they're pretty happy. Uh, you know, the Jennifer. Uh, uh, Grantham, our secretary of energy, I and mean, she's a bird brain, but uh, she's cheering this on because she hey, go go buy an eighty thousand dollar electric vehicle. It's like, wait a second, I can't afford to fill my tank, and you think I can go buy an eighty thousand dollar EV, which is made with lithium, by the way, um, the batteries. And uh, so, so yeah, we don't need 
to go there. That's not a subject for another day. But the point is, but you're right, Robert. This is is by design. Stupidity is not a sufficient explanation no. because it's actually working very well. You have to say this is what's intended, and they are screwing right. the middle class. And then you mentioned the WEF and all those other things, and you, you take grave risks, my friend, grave risks. Anyway, Jim, I, I could go on forever and ever and ever and ever, and the book is called Sold Out. Please understand it. Read that book because you're going to see the future, and then— my first book from with Jim was Currency Wars, which I understood because I was part of the um, Indonesian rupiah crisis out there in the in in, in uh, Singapore and all that. I was going, what the hell's going on here? Anyway, so Kim, final words for Jim. I, I appreciate I appreciate you, Jim, so much. And um, I just have one final question because I know we're out of time. Depression coming, not re- not not the other way around not yeah i think i think depression i i could argue we've been in a depression since 2006 but that's a you know again a subject for another day but but yeah something much worse than a recession but i also make the point that an economic recession or depression and a financial crisis are two different things you can have one without the other and we have but they can come together uh 2008 they came together and i think they're coming together again in 2023 Thank That's you. a liquidity Thank crisis you. and a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't talk about in public. Hey, Jim, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I just, I have, you know, you're a wealth, you're credible. I appreciate what you're doing. I have, applaud your courage. So Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank and you, we Jim. come back, we'll have a final word. So, so thank you again, Jim. The book is called Sold Out. Please read it. Bye.